Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Getting Personal with Parkinson's Facebook Live Weekly Conversation Series. I'm Caroline Colas, the Senior Director of Health and Wellness for the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan and the Program Coordinator for the Edmund J. Safra Parkinson's Wellness Program, supported by New York's largest healthcare provider, Northwell Health. For over 12 years, the JCC has been hosting programs for individuals living with PD. You can find our programs at www.mmjccm.org forward slash Parkinson. See link below in the comments section if you would like to click on that and participate in our program offerings. They're open to anyone living with Parkinson's. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. This program is for anyone whose life has been impacted by PD, those diagnosed as well as family and friends. We want this conversation to help put a face to Parkinson's and to introduce you to people living and thriving with PD. We will speak with experts who will share updates and research, and maybe even a celebrity or two like our guest today. We welcome your input if you wanna be a guest or if you know of someone we should feature or there's a specific topic of interest to you that you want us to cover, let us know. All inquiries can be directed to Whitney Chapman at wchapman at mmjccm.org. And her information will be in the comments section below as well. I'm now excited to introduce you to my dear friend, Chris Jones. Chris is a professional actor whose career has been covered, covered the stage, including Broadway, Off-Broadway, regional theater, and film, where he not only starred, but directed productions. His film credits include Moonstruck, Awakenings, The Village. Chris has been a long time participant in the Parkinson's wellness programs here at the JCC, having attended our yoga classes, our NIA for Parkinson's classes, and our water exercise classes as well. Chris and I had a chat that we pre-recorded, which I wanna share with you now, and then we'll be meeting you afterwards for a live Q&A. So if you have questions for Chris or for me, as you listen to our conversation, jot them down or put them in the chat and we'll happily answer them. And now, on with the show. Years ago, when we started the program, I didn't know what to, to expect, but I knew that the NIA technique engaged people in many different ways. It was about stimulation, stimulating with all different kinds of movements, stim stimulating with different emotions, stimulating by making different sounds. And lo and behold, it became kind of a perfect modality for people living with Parkinson's. But at the time, um, someone said to me, why don't you watch the film Awakenings? And so wow. I watched, right? I watched the film Awakenings and I was watching the film and you're in it. Yeah. And you were also in my class. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, wait a second, that's Chris. Right. And that was, before I had had a chance to go to any of our um, educational um, trainings, which we had many as instructors. Um, so uh, I just marveled at your artistry in that film. And then I, over the years, I've had the opportunity to watch you live. You came to a couple of my shows. That yeah. I Everyone that I've I've been able to come to since we've known each other, I haven't gotten to see your film yet. I'm excited about that. But how was it for you to be an actor? How has your training as an actor helped or facilitated your diagnosis? Do you know what I mean? Like like the vocal training that you had, or preparing for things, or you know, playing different parts. Has that helped you, do you think, in any way? Well, one of the things with Parkinson's is that it strips you of your, your gifts. Your voice mm -hmm. gets very thin. Your face becomes a mask, doesn't reveal very much. And it's, it, it, it's, it's a stripping away of, of what actors do, which is Teach us about what it's like to be a human being on this planet, mm -hmm. the time we have. It's an interesting thing that our life on the planet is finite. They say that, 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 that Parkinson's takes on the average, my neurologist said, maybe one and a half to two years off your lifespan. 
That's all. That's not so bad. Uh, there's a joke that goes, uh, I think it's from a Samuel Beckett play, Waiting for Godot. And it goes, my left lung is very weak. But my right lung is as strong as a bell. So That's exactly what I'm talking about. What happened with me is that I've lost my physicality mm -hmm. because I don't I don't move anymore, move much anymore. Do you think Parkinson's is your left lung and your life is your right lung? To use that analogy? Yes. I, I, the way I the way I think of it is that it's a competitive sport and Parkinson's and I are competitors in a sport that changes, the rules change as Parkinson's uh, get stronger and I get weaker. It, it takes, takes something away that I can't use anymore. When I was much younger, uh, I've had Parkinson's for 19 years. I went to a panel discussion that had experts talking about Parkinson's. There was a neurosurgeon, neurosurgeon who talked about deep brain stimulation. There was a nurse who talked about diet. There was a physical therapist who talked about PT. And there are all these experts talking about Parkinson's. But the last speaker was the one that caught my attention. He was a man who had Parkinson's. And his testimony was extraordinary because he said, what they don't tell you is the most important thing. What do you do when you can no longer do what you have always done? He was a trial lawyer and his voice got very quiet and his face was a mask that didn't, wasn't particularly suited for advocacy for his clients. And he didn't tell his employer because he was afraid that he would lose out on some work and some pay at his job. And then finally he had to tell them because they thought he was drunk mm -hmm. or abusing drugs. And he envisioned another job that he could do that could use his skills that wouldn't uh, require him to speak or be seen in a court of law. So he decided he would be an arbitrator and solve disputes, which he could do in the privacy of his home. And he could deliver a judgment by a written judgment. And so he extended his life uh, his working life for a few years. And I must say that the, the, the minister, my minister's wife, when I first came down with Parkinson's, said to me, if you have to have any disease, this is a good one to have because you have, you can live 10, 15, 20, 25 years at 60, 70, 80%, 80, 70, 60% capacity. I tried to think of something that I could do. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, why don't I try translating plays? I had translated a Chekhov play just to see if I could. I was in a play and I had problems getting from line A to line B in about five spots in my first scene. So I looked up in the original Russian. I'd taken Russian in college. I didn't remember much but I could use a dictionary and I looked in the original Russian and in all five places, he had, the translator had omitted or in some cases added a phrase. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'm pretty sensitive to this and maybe I should, should do it for the rest of my part. So if I could see if I could learn something, not to change his words, I did his words in the performance but in the hopes that I would get more information. So mm -hmm. uh, there's a section where 
in Three Sisters where Kuligan, the character I play, falls asleep and he wakes up at three in the morning and he sees his wife and he goes, Melia Moya Masha, Doroga Moya Masha, Melia Moya Masha, Doroga Moya Masha. My sweet Masha, my dear Masha, my kind Masha, my good Masha, usually translated. But the, notice the m, 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 m. It's like yum, 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 yum. It's like he wakes up, he sees his wife. I love you. I love you. Me, precious. Masha. Mm, my Masha. So I, I, got, I got something from that. I was wondering with this Zoom format, if that would actually make it easier for you. When you, you know, when you talk about acting and when you recite, you just come alive. Um, the problem is for me that I tend to go up. It's as if, which means to forget my lines. It happens to a lot of older actors. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when I was a younger actor working with older actors, thinking how, how sad for them and how sort of noble of them it was to keep trying when they couldn't, couldn't do it anymore. And, and then I turned into one of them. Talk a bit about nobility and what that means to you. About what? Nobility. Nobility? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it means doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And for you, as you're living with Parkinson's, what, what is doing the right thing for well, you? Well, I think you don't want to be a burden on your family. When I was first diagnosed, my wife was furious. She, I'm 14 years older than her as it is. And as I tell my kids, it's, it's as if I'm old before my time. Uh, it's just, uh, I'm 73 years old, but uh, I act like I'm 83. So she was angry at the, the, the prospect of the future and the mm -hmm. uncertainty of it. And I wasn't. And I think she was angry, doubly so because, because I wasn't. So she supplied the anger for the whole family. Mm -hmm. uh, she's since become very generous and I appreciate the tender mercies. I like to call them. There was a film with Robert Duvall called Tender Mercies. Mm -hmm. yeah. And your brother has Parkinson's also? Well, I've got two brothers. I had a grandfather on my mother's side and a grandmother on my father's side who had Parkinson's. He, he became very depressed. My brother, Jeff, came down with it when he was 55, diagnosed first when he was 55, as, as was I the same age, 55. He's two years older than me. And he just died this year. Oh, I'm um, so he, got, he got seriously depressed and he would howl in pain, mm. um, psychic pain. He would have about six to eight panic attacks a day. Oh, um, wow. And he, his wife sent my sister after his death, sent her a booklet of photographs of my brother from when she met, married him to the final hours. And the, the light that goes out in his eyes gradually from the Parkinson's period on is haunting. Hmm. It's, it's it says it all. Well, it doesn't say it all because there's so much that's good. Tell me about that. Uh, I think last summer I went with the kids and some of my uh, friends to a swimming hole. It was a rock 
surface that you jumped off into the water 10 feet below. And I did it. <laughs> it was great. It was hard climbing out of the water up the rock face. But, uh, but you went for it. In positive psychology, we talk about the swamp and the pond, meaning in every life, there's those swampy, dark, difficult, trying, the light going out moments. And there's also what you just talked about, which is the rock, the translation. Uh -huh. We, one, of the, one of the great things that's going on for me now is something that started in 2012. We did a documentary of two actors with Parkinson's, Dan Moran and myself. And we were working on a production of Samuel Beckett's Endgame. And it's a play about two characters with diminishing physical abilities played by two actors with diminishing physical abilities. Awesome. So it's it's kind of an interesting thing. And Beckett's mother had Parkinson's and his aunt had Parkinson's. And one of the interesting things about it is that as my acting world got smaller and smaller, uh, I was able to extend it to some extent by working on translations because mm -hmm. I get to say what every character, I get to write what every character says. So I get to be every character. And that, that extended my, my life. Chris, it seems like as an actor, you're willing to go to places that are dark. You know what I mean? Like that's part of the work, right? As you said earlier, what was your beautiful line? You said like acting is about revealing to people what it is to be human. To be human. Right. Yes. So, so it's like being willing to go and the characters that you play, go into like that dark um, misery or violent or angry or all the emotions, the playing the field of emotions. Can you, can you temper that at all? Do you, do you consciously say, okay, I'm going to play here and I'm going to also play here? Well, to and some you... extent, the, the words play you. Mm -hmm. They come out a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. there, there's a saying that acting is reacting. Mm -hmm. What you would, good acting is responding to an impulse of somebody else's huh. purely. And it's as if my body were a pool. And if someone does something on stage to me, they throw a pebble into my pool and it, my body receives it and sends out a plop with concentric circles going out from the pool. Only my pool is dried up and it's sand, so it doesn't go plop. It goes kerplunk, <laughs> thud, thud. I don't know about that. And so I don't, feels I don't have a natural response anymore. When the, my, my fellow actor is saying his line that precedes mine, I'm not actually listening to him, I'm saying in my, my mind, I'm going over my next line, which is a, which is a prescription for horrible acting. It's, it's bad acting, but it, it's the only acting I have left to me. People say to me, Chris, your acting is so pure. It's so simple. You don't do anything. <laughs> it's the way it comes out of the toothpaste. The toothpaste comes out of the tube. You don't have any control over it really. Well, I don't know if you're giving yourself enough credit. I think Well, that... I have I've I've got a lifetime of learning. Exactly. That it reminds I me have, of the I have a feel for it still. Yeah, of course. And it yeah. reminds me of the Velveteen Rabbit. Remember that 
children's story. Oh, and I want to I want to ask you about your kids basically. And but the Velveteen Rabbit, right? The Velveteen Rabbit is sort of rubbed and loses everything until it's kind of all that's left is is the essence of of what it is. And maybe mm -hmm. that is there are, maybe that is what happens to us even as we as we age and as we get closer to you know letting go of this body and this form and and moving on. But I wonder speaking of you know I was referring to a children's story. I just wonder you had young children when you received your diagnosis. How how was that? And how have they well, managed? I received my diagnosis in the morning before rehearsal of a play that I was about two weeks into the rehearsal period. And I, the doctor said to me, after an hour of battery of tests of going like this with my fingers, going like this, he tapped my forehead, he watched me walk and in an hour of tests. He said, well, you've got Parkinson's, almost mm -hmm. cheerfully. And I said, you're kidding. He said, no. And I was sort of relieved to know why. I, I thought it was a pinched nerve in my shoulder. Mm. But I was sort of relieved. But then in the, in the subway ride to rehearsal that morning after the diagnosis, I thought of my kids, mm -hmm. twin girls and my son. And I started to weep. Mm -hmm. because I was afraid that they would never know what a terrific actor their dad was. Mm -hmm. But I have had, they've been able to see me in a lot of shows. And I think they, they I think I was premature on that. Mm -hmm. But they, they've been, my kids have been so positive. My daughter, Charlotte, we were walking, the family was walking up from Riverside to West End Avenue on 75th Street. And it's a hill up to climb. And I was walking slower and Charlotte hung back with me. And she said after a while, Dad, thanks for hanging back with me. I can't go that fast. <laughs> It's <laughs> very transparent, but I appreciate it. Uh, I think one of my favorite plays is a play by Brian Friel, an Irish writer of the second half of the 20th century. He did a, he's done lots of plays that he's written, and I've done a couple of them, but one called Aristocrats. Mm. He was by no means a skillful tennis player, father, but oh my goodness, he was very consistent and very determined. Alice and I would be over there and he'd be here. And before he served, he always went through a long ritual of placing his toe precisely on the edge of the line, moving it and adjusting it for about 20 seconds until he had it exactly where he wanted it, as if the whole game depended on the exact placing of his toe. Well, of course, this always had Alice and me into fits of secret giggling, so when he finally did serve the ball, we were never able to return it. And so he thought he was a much better player than he really was. Yes, wonderful, wasn't it? Oh, but God help you if he caught you laughing. That's a snatch from that play. Lovely. Amazing. What inspires you and what sustains you? Well, inspiration is breath, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I guess trying to trying to do away with the, the life in here, separate the life in here from the life out there. Mm -hmm. to, be, to breathe. That, that's inspiring. And what sustains you? Uh, my, my kids do. Mm -hmm. And my wife. Mm -hmm. I think 
I think that's 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 the cherry on the top, and and the meat, of course, mm -hmm. with all the vegetables. <laughs> and besides medication, what activities or things do you do that help you manage your Parkinson's? Well, I do PT. I do classes with you. Mm -hmm. And I, it was a period where I would get very teary in class whenever we, Louis Armstrong would talk about this beautiful world. Mm -hmm. You know that song? Mm -hmm. Louis Armstrong? Yeah. How does it go? Um, and I think to myself. And myself, what a wonderful world. world. Yeah. 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 And I would be going, sobbing, while mm -hmm. he was singing, and we were all together, mm -hmm. keeping it going. The trick, yeah. of course, is to find something interesting to do. But as, as it gets harder and harder. So it's maintaining your curiosity. Well, the, the, the curiosity is, is hard to have when your mind is covered with a blanket. Mm. Uh, it's muffled. It, it doesn't feel sharp. What has Parkinson's taught you? It wants to have the last word in the conversation. And it's taught me to keep the conversation going on. There's another yeah. thing from uh, Brian Fields' play, Aristocrats. The character says, when I first saw it, my father, when I arrived, it reminded me of a poem, my father dying. And the last lines go, but on any one of these nights soon, for you, the dark will not crack with dawn. And then I will begin with you, that hesitant conversation going on and on. And uh, you know, I'm struck by your honesty. Always. What do you look forward to each day? I have a practice where I, no matter how bad a day is, I look for something, something that's good. Well, I have activities that are. Uh, borderline possible to continue to do, such as swinging my legs over the bed in the morning and getting up. Uh, this morning, for example, I did something I'd never done before. I woke up at 6.30 in the morning, 6.20, and I was, uh, I was in the reclining sofa with a TV on, but not no picture. I had slept all night hmm. and I didn't, didn't get up once. And I used to have a problem of getting up to go to the bathroom about five, four or five times a night. And I've licked that. I, I, I get up maybe once or last night, not at all. So that was a, that was a plus of, of the minus of not being in my bed at night. Mm. But I, I look forward to, I've got a, a hook that I can hook my hand on and pull to help myself get up. But there are several motions that have to occur. And one is the legs have to go back and the legs have to be thrown forward and the arm has to be, the arm has to be pulled and they have to have them in the right order. And with Parkinson's, it's hard to initiate, to get the proper sequence. So I wanna make sure that, uh, that I can get out of bed in the morning. It's a simple, it's a small thing, but it's, it's, it's it looms large. Mm. And one last thing, one last question, Chris. Oh. 
you talked about that lawyer who was on the panel and how what he said really made a difference. For somebody that's newly diagnosed, what would you say? I would say it's not over. You got a, you got a lot of a lot of good things to play with, and uh, my my uh, neurologist said to me as he left the office that we were in for the diagnosis. He said to me, he turned around and he looked and he said, "Watch out for depression." And that's something that I haven't had. Uh, I, I'm not sure why, when my brother had it so terribly. Mm -hmm. uh, but in some senses, you can understand how a person could be depressed sure. as their, their abilities got less and less. And depression is is often anger and not expressed. Is that correct? I've heard that being said before. Oh. You know, I and I know. What would I say to someone with Parkinson's? Get on the meds. Don't 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 think that if you hold back at the beginning. You'll be able to use them in the end. Use them now. Is you want to be as as, as as mobile, as active, and as engaged as you possibly can. So that's one thing I'd say. Get on the meds uh, awesome. because they really make a difference. Mm -hmm. When I started. I could be late with a dosage or even skip a dosage and I wouldn't feel it. But the last three or four years, if I'm, if I, if I'm an hour late with a dosage, I feel it. The other, the other thing I'd say to them is find something that you're interested in, that you're curious about or that you're like, for me, it was doing translations of plays. And that led into writing a memoir of my years mm -hmm. in the theater and how Parkinson's intersected with it. Wow. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for spending time with me. Oh, it's good to talk to you. It's good to see you. It's great to uh, see you. We'll you do it again. OK. We'll do it again, OK? OK. Chris, are you there? Come on to uh, the screen. We'll let him do that. Wow, it's just so wonderful to see that video again. There you are, my friend. How are you? Let's see if we can get you off mute. Maybe uh, I can ask you to unmute and that might help. There I you got, go. You got it. I'm a little slow. My meds haven't kicked in. Mm, that's all right. No worries. So you're in a new location. Yeah. Um, can you tell me about that? You recently moved into an assisted living facility. It's a can I ask you what made you decide to make this move and how it's been for you and your family since we last talked? I think my, my wife was interested in keeping me safe during the day. And it's, it's not an ideal situation. But I'm only a 20 minute cab ride from my apartment. So I'm, it's in Riverdale. So it's, I get to go home, and be with my family when they're there. The drawback is that I can only uh, take 10 nights away from the facility a year. So uh, it means I can't go to visit my sister for two weeks in Florida. Right. Uh, yeah. huh. it's, uh, the, the, the the negative perception of it is that you're being thrown in the in the dung heap. Uh, you're being chucked away like a banana skin. 
but I've, I'm, I've been here 10 days or about 10 days. And it was, it was shocking getting here. Mm -hmm. I went to my dining hall my first day and there were only two people allowed at a table for COVID. And there was one woman sitting and down and I said, you mind if I join you for dinner? She said, no, you can't sit here. My friend sits here. <laughs> so so it, it was, I viewed it as sort of a hostile environment. <laughs> yeah. The natives weren't friendly, but I met mm -hmm. a lot of people that are, that are kind of interesting. And one, one lady said to me this morning when we were getting our medicines, uh, Every time you sh sh you shut your eyes and open them, you have a chance to see something beautiful. Oh. And, and that was something beautiful this morning. Yeah. What a great thing to say. And so true. And so true. And the, 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 the yesterday morning, um, and I was having breakfast, and there was a light in the room. The glow to the proceeding. It's as if someone had turned the meter from one and a half to ten. And it was the room was glowing. And I thought, well, maybe this will work. I don't know. Uh, I'm sign. trying it for two months to see if I can make it work. Well, you have to keep us posted. Yeah. You mentioned that you're uh, writing a memoir of your yeah. life in the theater. How's yeah. it coming? It's, do you have time to do that when you're there? Well, I have time. I've, I've, I've spent a few hours on it since I've been here. Mm. I don't have, I don't have the will power to do things and get them done that I had a couple of years ago. So that it's, it's heavy going. I, I, I'm close to finishing the third draft. Wow. And I hope a final draft. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's got a very interesting, for me, chapters. I talk about the 10 best directors I worked with. And uh, they're, they're, they're an, an odd assortment. The first one was, the first director of Broadway show was Harold Pinter. Oh, gosh. Uh, he's an extraordinary man. And... I remember the first time I met him, uh, he was in the auditorium of the theater and I was entering from backstage onto the stage and his back was towards me. And when he turned around, I thought he was one of the most beautiful men I'd ever seen. Very handsome, he had a safari jacket on and his jaw jutted it out, exposing the, the world to his tobacco stained teeth. And he was, he was very funny in, a, in an interesting way. Uh, uh, I talk about him and Mike Nichols and uh, mm. some other directors. And I talk about uh, my, my early days, my training. And I, I think it, 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 I start the, the, the memoir off with, uh, describing how I was doing a play by Moliere called Don Juan. I was playing Scannerell and he opens the show with a lecture to the audience on why taking snuff is good for you. Well, the, the director changed it from snuff to tobacco, cigarettes, because he thought the audience wouldn't know what snuff was. And he didn't want to start the play on a note of uncertainty. So he said, it's a lecture to the audience on why smoking is good for you. And I noticed when I lit the cigarette with my right hand, my right hand would shake. And sometimes it would shake so much that I couldn't light the cigarette. Mm -hmm. And once it blew out and, and I, I didn't know what it was. I thought it was a pinched nerve in my shoulder. Mm -hmm. And so the, the rest is, is my history. history. Yeah. Wow. And that was when you were 55. 55. 
What a surprise! My powers. Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. Better and better as an actor, stronger and stronger. When did you? How old were you when you did Awakenings? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I think it was before I was married. Hmm. So it was in my early 40s, I think. Mm -hmm. early and how was it? How was it working with De Niro? Well, I didn't have, I had not much scenes with him. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting that the drug that is, that is the, in, in Awakenings that was used for the patients who were asleep for years is L-Dopa. Yeah. Dopamine, which is right. the And they didn't know when they started how much to give or how often to give it. There were serious side effects if you got it wrong. And, right. Uh, my grandfather was one of the first people to get the drug. Mm -hmm. And he, 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 he suffered from hallucinations and, uh -huh. and depression. Uh, he was once out sitting in the patio uh, overlooking the lake. And he saw out of the corner of his eye something in the front yard. And he went, oh, my mother said, what is it? Said, A horse and buggy. Mm -hmm. He said, do you still see it? He said, no. Did it frighten you? She said, no. And so wow. I'm ready for the hallucinations to have happen for me. <laughs> Hoping they'll come, right? <laughs> as back to that imagination, as long as they're things of beauty. Then what the happens? Be, it'll be an MG midget. <laughs> What has uh, surprised you, if anything, about when you've been writing your memoir? It's a creative process. So. How good it is, how, how terrific it is, how funny it is, how, how true it is. Mm. There is a, a joke that about an actor who's doing Hamlet, and he says to the director, I understand all the relationships. His father, the ghost, uh, demanding his mother in a losing battle with the bottle, his uncle, too slick for his own good. Horatio, a good student, a good friend. Rosa Grants and Gilders, a terrible student, terrible friend. But Ophelia, I don't know, does Hamlet sleep with Ophelia? And the director says, always on tour. <laughs> <laughs> so, and what everyone should know is that you usually supply us with jokes at the end of my class every single time and everyone looks forward to it well I think you, some people might might not look forward to it i've had, I've had situations where I, I was not allowed to tell a joke uh, in a union meeting actors union meeting because it was offensive to the people that I was joking. It was a oh. Polish joke. I said, I got to tell you this Polish joke. And I said, no, you can't. It's, it's, it's wrong. It's offensive. And I said, mm. I don't know any Poles. How could, how could it be offensive? It's not, it's not about Poles. It's about telling a joke. And so I, I'm going to tell you the joke. Oh, you're going to? OK. The guy walks into a bar and he says to the bartender, I got this great Polish joke for you. The bartender says, whoa, 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 whoa. You see those two bouncers at the front door? They're Polish. You see those four bikers with the skulls tattooed on their foreheads? They're Polish. And I'm Polish, says the bartender. You sure you want to tell this joke? And the guy says, what, and I have to explain it seven times? <laughs> oh, so that, that gets my funny bone. It's, it's, not, it's not a Polish joke, is it? No. It's the same. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for sharing your lunchtime with me.
and for all the wonderful resources you shared, but mostly just for sharing your spirit and your creativity and, and your honesty, you know, uh, anything that you would, uh, like to leave us with. Uh, I'd like to perform for you. Oh, yes, please. This is from a play called La Bette. It's about a Moliere acting troupe. Uh, they're, they're lived a subsistence life, stealing chickens from farms to, to, to get by. And they're discovered by the prince and he brings them to the court and they become the national players. And they, have, they eat wonderful food and they're celebrated in their success. Uh, and the prince thinks after a couple of years that he'd like to shake them up a bit. They're getting a bit stale. So he gets a solo player and he adds him to the mix and he becomes a member of the team. But the leader of the of the of the acting group hates the guy and does the things he's terrible because the first thing he says is gentlemen i hope i'm not intruding and then he because he, 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 he takes over it's, the play is written in iambic pentameter rhyme couplets the entire play is rhyme couplets i don't know how i do it i just do these epigrams they come to me as do collects upon a budding daffodil a curse a blessing call it what you will it's mine to bear this genius of the word did i say genius i think it's absurd when people call you that don't you agree to us it comes like breath so naturally it seems like sorcery to those below i say that telling phrase from cicero de bonum est this bonum est Oh shit. Well, anyway, you get the gist of it. I do love Latin. Does it show? It's true. I'm something of a scholar in it too. Yes, I've read them all. Even I'm impressed from Cicero to, you know, all the rest whom I can quote in full without abatement, but I digress. That's, 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 that's one of my favorites. Mm. Wonderful. Chris, I could listen to you forever. Thank oh, you. Good, thank you. Thank, thank you for giving me the, the platform to, to, to relive my, my youth. Absolutely. The um, we'll, have you, we'll have you back on the show again for more. Okay. And um, everyone, thank you for stopping by the JCC's Facebook page to join us today. Please let us know in the comments below that you enjoyed. Um, Chris's presentation or what you learned or if you have any questions. And now remember, if you'd like to sign up for our Living with Parkinson's programs at the Marlene Myers and JCC Manhattan, they're available to anyone living with Parkinson's. There's a link in the comments where you can fill out an intake form and you can email Whitney if you have any questions or thoughts about that. Uh, for now, I'm just going to sign off and say thank you so much, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Take care. Good. Bye.